Amen, and good morning, Liberty Church. Welcome once again this morning. As we are the church gathered, whether we are gathering in this room or we are gathering online, online church, I want to welcome you. Thank you for being here today, for joining with us. And as Pastor Matt said, if you're new here, we want to give you a special welcome, say thank you, your family, come join us every opportunity that you have. Uh, I'm Pastor Wayne. I am able to be here this morning. What a privilege it is to stand on this platform and to share with you what I believe God has placed on my heart. But on behalf of Pastors Josh and Kristen, I want to say uh, from them to you that they love you, they miss Issue. They've been celebrating Christmas and the holidays in New York. Uh, they're back home now, but I understand Pastor Josh is a bit under the weather and may have had uh, contracted the flu. Uh, at any rate, be praying for them and their whole household uh, as we have so much of this going around and people catching it, and we're just praying for healing and wholeness. One thing I know is our pastors love you and are praying for you and uh, seek the best for us all as we move into the things that God has for us uh, into this new year. And uh, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, it is a privilege for me to be a part of this church family. It's a privilege to be here standing before you. And I have a question that I'd like to start off with as we get underway here today in this portion of our service. And that is, how many have ever faced a mountain in your life? I'm not, not necessarily talking about a physical mountain, you know, where you see Everest, you say, I'm going to go climb that. But I'm talking about the mountain of there is something that is in your life that you just don't know how you're going to get over it. You don't know how you're going to get around it. You know, you don't know how you're going to get through it. But there is this necessity to know that I need to be on the other side. Because I'm in this place right now, God is bringing me to this place, but I have this going on in my life. I venture to say that every single one of us can say that we have had one of those mountains, whether it be in the past, whether it be something we're going through right now, and if we haven't, I can promise you it's coming. The question is, how do we get through it? I remember when Sue and I were first married, we had a bit of a mountain. This is just sort of an illustration, but our mountain was a mountain of firewood. Somehow or another, we ended up with this mountain of firewood in our front yard right next to the driveway that we kept saying, we need to get that eyesore out of the way into the backyard where it goes. I was working for a construction company at the time, and uh, I was gone before daylight, came in after dark. It was that time of year. We were just kept looking at it, kept putting it off. Those things kept happening until I came home one day and the mountain was gone. It had disappeared. So I went in and talked to Sue. She said, yeah, I moved it. I said, you moved it? Yeah, I moved it. And I said, how did you do that? And she said, one log at a time. Uh, she just went out there, she grabbed a log, and over the fence it went. Then she grabbed another one, and over the fence it went. And she said, I, 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 I soon learned that this whole thing will be done if I just move it one log at a time. And you know, to this day, if we are facing things in our life that looks like there's no end to it, how in the world are we going to get to the other side? What's the process we're going to be? Our code to each other is, well, we'll do this. And it'll just be one log at a time. It'll just be that process that we know that we just move forward to make it happen. You know, Jesus said that if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be moved. And we expect the mountain just to break up and fall off in one whole piece out into the sea. But it never said that it might be one tablespoonful at a time. 
And that's, that's what we want to talk about today as we move from 2023 into 2024. How is it that we are going to stand in a place to know that God is bringing us somewhere, and if there is a mountain in the way, how in the world are we going to do this? You may not know this, but there is a powerful but very simple secret to doing really big things and seeing really big growth in your life that you can see in 2024. And it's the secret to get this. We don't get to say this word often. It is the secret to everything, whether it be that we are wanting to run a 5K or a marathon, we are wanting to get our degree. We are wanting to, you fill in the blank with whatever you want to fill it with, whatever destination you want, whatever dream that God has called you to, whatever it is, this is the key to seeing the real change and growth in your life every way. You want to know what it is? At the risk of sounding like an infomercial, I could easily say right here, but wait, there's more. But there's really not. There's really not. There is a secret that will take you from where you are to where you want to be at the end of 2024. And it is the fact that you have to take the prescribed steps to get the preferred outcomes. There is no shortcut. There is no, you know, just tucking it away. In other words, if you want to get fit, you have to stick to the training plan. If you want to finish a degree, you have to go to class. If you want to run a marathon, you have to train in bursts and in moments and to have a powerful faith. Who in here would want a more powerful faith than you already have right now? Uh, I know that, that I would, and I'm still growing in the grace and the knowledge of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that he is working and moving in me. But if we are going to grow to have a powerful faith in 2024, it will be as we are taking the prescribed steps to get the preferred outcomes. Where do you see yourself sitting at the end of 2024? You know, you could find yourself sitting there and going, wow, look at what God has accomplished Look at what he's done through my life as I hear testimonies of people's lives being changed, of things moving forward, the testimonies that I get to tell. You know, Stephen Covey, back in the 90s, I think it was, when he wrote that book, you know, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, says you begin with the end in mind. In other words, if you want to be known as the best husband, you make decisions today. If you want folks to say at your funeral, boy, he was a great husband. You live every day making choices to be a good husband. If you want to be a person of strong faith, powerful faith at the end of 2024, what do we do? We take steps each and every day to move in the direction that that would accomplished. You can do that. That can be you if you will take the steps to get there. And that's what this message is all about today. That's why it matters. Because you can, you can live a powerful life of faith in 2024 if you will devote yourself to one powerful habit. One habit made up of 52 amazing steps. This habit will help us to grow in our knowledge of the Word of God. 
This one habit will help us to be more uh, uh, in tune with worship and praising God and living closer to God in 2024. It impacts our spiritual life in every, in every way because this one habit incorporates all of these other things into it, and you can have it through these 52 amazing steps. So let's begin now with step number one. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going through 52 steps. But we are going to reveal that this one habit this one thing that will change our life as we devote, that's a key word, as we devote ourselves to it and give ourselves to it fully is ecclesia, Greek for the church. It's the church. It's the church. That's what this gathering right here is all about. And yes, I know I feel like I may be preaching to the choir because here it is, December the 31st. Many people are gone, but you are here. You are here. And so that commitment is already being seen in you and what you are doing. But let's hone that and commit ourselves to that place of, of celebration that we are part of each and, every week, each and every week. Look at how we get to be together, to join together in worship as a corporate body thanking God for what he has done and is continuing to do in our lives, allowing him to speak to us and move us and shape us into his image and all that he wants to do in us. As a matter of fact, let's just take a quick look at what the Bible says about the, the, the gathering, the church. In Hebrews 10, it says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. I trust that as you came through the door, you realize that in this gathering place, there is a time that we get together for encouraging one another, spurring one another on to love and good deeds, to be the best that God has called us to be. Not just coming in the door and saying, well, here I am. No, I am here for a purpose. And my purpose is to help you be better. And your purpose is to help me be better as we spur each other on to love and good deeds. Uh, Matthew 18, 20 says, For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. There am I with them. Acts 2 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, not just Sundays, every day they committed to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You see what is happening here within this book, within this writing, is that the church is gathering Sundays, yes, the church is gathering to be encouragers and strengtheners, admonishers, whatever is the need, because as I'm weak, one of you will be strong and can encourage me, vice versa, being the body of Christ together, but not only now, because we, the people, are the church. 
and we break bread together from away from here. We are part of small groups together. We are part of life together. And the church is wherever we go. And we see God doing amazing things because we have yielded ourselves to him. The, then from 1 Peter, man, I want you to write this down. I want you to wear this as an identity. Put it on a name badge, the hello, my name is. I want you to put this under that because it says, but you are a chosen people. Let that sink in. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's who we are. That's who God has called us to be. Matthew 16, 18 says, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So you see, the Bible says many things about the church, the church body, God's family, who he has called us to be, for that's who we are. This is a family. Welcome. We're all in this together. And here's the good news. Might not sound like good news, but it's good news that we're all, none of us are perfect. We're not perfect. Well, what makes that good news is because God in his grace and mercy is in our midst, leading us together, growing each other, using one another to help each other grow as we move on toward perfection because he is moving us from where he found us to where he wants us to be. Our job in this process is to be yielded to him and trust him that where we are, whatever the speed bump is, whatever the mountain is that's in our way, whatever is there, that we're trusting God to be the one that walks the journey with us and he's going to get us to the other side. This is not something that God dreamed of as a plan B. All through the history of mankind, we have seen God work in his people and through his people to, to, to mold us and shape us into his likeness. If you remember from Numbers. You remember the story of Moses. We're not going to go back and read it because it's way too long. Pastor Clint alluded to it as he was setting up uh, communion today. But in all of the things that God has done, when he called Moses, he was tired of seeing his people live in slavery, in bondage, and he called Moses and he said, I want you to lead my people from Egypt, from the land of bondage, into the promised land, which is a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, we love being delivered from the bondage. And we love arriving at the place called the land of promise, the land of milk and honey. What gets difficult is that space in between that we don't quite know what to do with. Because you see, as, as God delivered the people from Egypt, they were out of slavery. They were out of Egypt. As, as you've heard it said before, Egypt was not out of them. There's a certain mindset, there's a certain way of life, there's a certain way of doing things that has to be broken to prepare a person to inherit the land of promise, the land of milk and honey, and God was doing that in the desert. And in Numbers 11, we, will, we, we would see as we go back and read that, that Moses had been in the desert a couple of years. He'd been leading these people, and all of a sudden, they started complaining. Probably not all of a sudden, but they started complaining. 
All we have is this manna to eat. All we have is blah, 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 blah. And as they were traveling from one place to another, they failed to remember what God had already done in them. Think about it. Delivered them from slavery. Pretty good thing. As they were being chased by Pharaoh, he parted the sea. Pretty good thing. Get to the other side. Everybody's healthy and whole. Pretty good thing. Get out there, and there's nothing to eat, but God provides the manna. But the manna was three times a day, every day, <sighs> for a couple of years, and they were tired of it. And because they were in this place that was so routine, they started forgetting the other blessings and started complaining, complaining, complaining. So much so that we have quite the prayer by Moses to God, and I'll read that portion for you. And Moses said, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you are going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me now. I think we've all been in a position like that at some point. You know, Lord, I don't, I don't see what we're going to do here. I don't see how it's going to change, what's going to happen. But God heard his prayer. God heard his prayer. They did not see what God was accomplishing in all this because in all of this, he was teaching them to trust him. Not the surroundings, not what looked good, not what the world could fix, but how in the world can we trust you, God, to bring us to where you want us to be? So the whole thing about these people moving from here to here is trusting God in the process. Well, we say, well, look at them. They weren't very thankful, were they? Well, what about us? What about us? Let's superimpose our story on this story. Think about it. We, as Paul says, are dead in our sins and trespasses. We are hopeless. God brings Jesus into the world as a Savior to take on my sin and your sin so that we are set free from the bondage of slavery or the bondage of sin and be moved into this land of promise that we are going to as he is preparing for us that mansion, that place of peace, that hope. But this place in between is a journey. And on this journey, what God is doing is teaching us how to trust him. Let's cut back to Moses. Moses said, what are we going to do? God says, bring me 70 men, and we'll begin the process of showing you how to get through this. So 70 men were brought. They were standing there, and God took the power of Moses, the spirit that he had entrusted to Moses, and put it on these 70 so that the burden would not be too heavy for him. Back to us. What does God do with us? God gathers us together as his people in order that we can serve, in order that we can share, in order that we can grow together and it not be too heavy on anybody, but we become indeed the iron sharpening the iron, the places where we are able to learn from one another, strengthen each other in testimony, in favor and be all that God has called us to be. 
It is so easy, like Peter did, though, to step out into that new journey, get our eyes on the wind and on the waves, and begin to sink, and begin to say, woe is me. Woe is me. I never, I, never, I, I never bought into this. This is not what I expected. But this is exactly how God brings us to that place of perfection, that place of growth. If we are going to grow, we go through these seasons. Psalm 23 says, even though we walk through the darkest valley, I will be with you, trusting him. That's what it's about, trusting him, trusting that God is with me even now, that nothing has surprised him. So let me remind you that we are family. And as family, this family has a purpose. We have a purpose. And that is to help one another grow in our spiritual walk. And not each other only, but those who are the, on the outside who are indeed looking for something that is true, something that is good, something that has power, something that can give hope. And folks, we have it. We have it. But our purpose is to allow God to flow through us, moving forward through us, changing us in order that the hope that we find we can give away, help others to be changed as well. People changing because of Jesus is not just a slogan here, not a slogan at all. It speaks to who we are and how we can make a difference in this world that we live in. That is our purpose. And when this family gathers, life change happens. I'm talking about this family Listen to this. You may not know this, but in 2023, across our campuses, there were more than 900 decisions for Jesus. Isn't that awesome? I think that deserves 900 people in 2023 became new creatures in Christ because of God's grace and his mercy. More than 300 people were baptized. Almost 4,000 people every single Sunday get to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's just a glimpse of what happened in the previous 52 amazing Sundays. I had somebody remind me between services that it's a strange year. We actually had 53 Sundays. Uh, okay. Um, I cannot wait to see what God does in the next 52 Sundays. And you're invited to be a part of it. Like I've already said, it's like encouraging the choir because you're already here. But God is doing something to help us move from being attenders, from a hobby to a habit, from being those who are here to those who are here and trusting and moving and believing in God. 2023 was incredible, but lean in right here and think about this. In the next 10 years, we as Liberty Church are on a mission to raise up 100 leaders, plant 10 new Liberty Church locations to finish launching a hundred more churches around the world and so, so many more amazing initiatives. So, as the church, 52 Sundays, 52 steps, 52 ways of growing in what God wants us to become. 
challenging, going, giving, encouraging, being with one another. We exist to change lives. And when you get involved, not just the hobby, but when you get involved and change, be involved in changing someone else's life, the life that is really changed the most is yours, is yours. Because when you get a sense of what God is doing there it, for all eternity, you've made an impact on somebody's life for all eternity. Will you let God change your life? Will you let him walk in you? Today, we can choose to begin the journey from where we are to where God wants us to be. By choosing to be engaged, to be faithful, to be disciplined and devoted, to take your next step each and every week. So I want to give you a one-year challenge. A one-year challenge. Will you go all in? in this one habit for 2024, carried out in 52 amazing steps throughout the year of being involved in the family of faith, the church. Now, I'm going to take a poll. If that's you, if that's you, and you're going to commit yourself to these 52 weeks, these 52 amazing steps, and give it all and be all in, if that's you, what I want you to do is to remain seated. Thank you. It's unanimous. So we're all in for this coming year in 2024. That's just the way it works. But you will make a difference as you give yourself to this. One Sunday, one week, one log at a time. God's going to do amazing things, and I can't wait. Perhaps you've not. I heard Pastor Clint uh, mention this during communion, and perhaps you've not started that journey yet. One thing I don't want you to think is that as we give ourselves to Jesus, that everything, all of our problems just go away. That's not the way it works. What we are doing is inviting Jesus to be with us in and through everything that, he, that we face, understanding that he is using all things, causing all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And if we walk in life realizing nothing that we face has surprised him, that God is going to do something amazing and our lives will be changed, and we'll get to the end of 2024 blown away by what God has done, not only in us, but through us for him. So right now, in just a moment, I'm going to pray with you and, uh, and for you. And if you are one that has not made that commitment to walk with him yet, knowing that God has the best for you, I want to invite you to begin that process in this new year. Not a better time. Not, it, it's a perfect time to say, Lord, I'm tired of trying to free myself from this bondage, from this sin, from this stuff that I've been trying to break through. I know that I need a Savior, and only you can be that for me. If that would be you, not going to embarrass you or call you forward, would you raise your hand and just give yourself today? Thank you. Thank you. God, is, God loves you, and God is wanting to work in you. And if today is that day that you say, okay, Lord, I've been sort of a hobby for a little while, but I want to be involved in this family of faith in a new way to a new level accomplishing what you want me to accomplish would you raise your hand let me pray for you as well thank you thank you amen thank you let's pray together and pray with me if you would everyone praying lord jesus i invite you into my heart please forgive me of my sin and be lord of my life Please take resident 
in my heart as I know it is no longer I who live, but you who lives in me. I thank you that you have brought me to this family of faith. Help me to trust you in all things. Thank you, Jesus, for my new life. For it's in your name I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Happy New Year.